Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my very special guest, Katie Holder, former message believer. Katie, it's so good to have you on today. We've tried this a few times, and <clears throat> life just seems to get in the way, but we have found a way to get together and to talk about your time, you know, during the message and what it's like uh, post-message after, you know, after leaving the group. And I thought it'd be good if you could just take a moment and introduce yourself and um, how you came in contact with the message. Hi, it's nice to be here. Yes, it did take a while to uh, finally get this going. We had about seven or eight inches of snow this past week, so we were snowed in and everything was crazy, but I'm glad we finally made it. So yes, um, my name is Katie Holder. I um, was born into the message, so I'm 32. I was in it until just recently. I was born into it in California. Um, my parents were witnessed to by a message believer shortly before I was born. And I, um, so I was born, what, as they say, born onto the pew, I guess. Um, my mom played piano in church. Um, my dad was a preacher. So uh, this is all I knew my whole life. Um, I moved around a lot throughout the message. So I've been to a lot of different churches, um, a lot of the main I guess you would consider the main sect churches in the message throughout my life and then finally landed in Tennessee, which is where I've been for the past, oh gosh, 20 years, I guess. That makes me feel old. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you were one of the few message believers um, who came from California. Tell us a little bit about that because California is this <clears throat> weird place in the message. In the main sect, we... We feared going there, but I recently, I think it was just last year, I took a trip out there, and <laughs> there are churches in L.A., and this is the city that is supposed to, well, was supposed to have sunk before uh, Billy Paul became an old man. So uh, that's William Branham's son, Billy Paul. Tell us a little bit about the California story. Yeah, so it's really interesting to me that there are a lot of churches in california still you would think you know there's this big stigma in the message california's going under don't be in california but it is crazy that there are churches out there um and yeah that was something that i've followed very closely coming from california was the whole you know billy paul was supposed to have you know shark swimming where he was standing before he was an old man so when billy paul died recently that was a huge um stepping stone for me in my right. journey out of the message because suddenly this whole you know prophecy or whatever it was that i have followed my whole life because of where i came from was suddenly you know totally proven wrong so that was huge for me i didn't live in california very long um, the church that I was born into split over um, some sexual misconduct very shortly after I was born. I think I was three. And we moved up to Washington and went to a very large church in Canada after that. And we were there for like five years. So um, I don't really have a lot of memories of being in California at that age. But I do remember things from when I had moved up to Washington and we crossed the border into Canada a lot. Um, and then when we left Canada, we came back to California actually to one of the ministers in that church that had split, had started his own church, like just a small garage church. And that's where we ended up in California. So I do remember that part of being in California because I was, you know, I don't know, eight years old at that time or so. Um, I don't know. At that time, I was young. I didn't know anything about California going under. So I was just, you know, <laughs> happy kid in church, oblivious. Um, but it is looking back, it is strange to me that so many message believers still live in California. I mean, you know, you would think there would be this huge movement to get out. But yeah, I don't know. It's strange. I don't. I wonder what they are thinking. <laughs> it is odd. Um one of the places that I had to visit when I was there was the where the May Company used to be, <clears throat> because the alleged prophecy went like this. Before you were an old man, 
or the exact word, the exact phrase is you won't be an old man until, which essentially means <laughs> this is going to happen before you're an old man, right? <clears throat> but it happened in front of this maze department store. And so I, I actually paid the, uh, <clears throat> paid a cab to, to take us out there so I could get some photos. And I was expecting some fancy place, but it was <laughs> under construction. It was a museum of some kind, like the film industry, I believe it was. And <clears throat> it's just so odd because at that time, Billy Paul was still alive. And now I'm told after he has passed, I'm told that several ministers are saying, well, that prophecy was actually fulfilled because they had some temporary tank <laughs> that held a shark in it <clears throat> in this building. And, you know, it's just it's absurd the way that they've twisted and spun it, because I remember when I was in the message, I had to take a business trip out there and just like literally walking off the plane, I could feel my, my breath was taken from me. I was trembling and the people with me looked at me funny. What are you, what's wrong with John? And <laughs> it was, I, I thought I was walking out and preparing to die. I mean, that's how bad it was. But so you have, you share, um, the story, very similar to some of the others we've talked about, you've been through some church splits. And <laughs> as, as we go forward with these testimonies, you'll see this recurring theme of there was sexual misconduct and then the church split. There was sexual misconduct and then that church split. There was more sexual misconduct and then that church split. <clears throat> so it seems like this is this recurring theme. Um, how many times in your past were you involved in a church where that happened? Was it just that one time? So I have been to two churches that actually actively split while I was attending. Um, I know that the church in Canada that we had gone to when we left California the first time, um, that church did subsequently split. Um, I want to say maybe 10 years after we left or so, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but it did as well split over sexual misconduct. Um, so I just, we weren't attending at the time. So, yeah. you know, um, and then yes, there was another church here in Tennessee, um, when I was around 11 or 12 years old that we were attending that, um, split wide open on a Wednesday night service. And I remember that very vividly. That's a, that's a good story. <laughs> wow. Tell us the story. Okay. So, um, we actually, my dad was on a business trip. Um, I can't remember, he was overseas somewhere. And the, oddly enough, the friends who had started the garage church in California that we had gone to for a while, they were up visiting um, my family and kind of spending time with my mom while my dad was gone. And so we thought, well, we'll take you to church at our church tonight. It was a Wednesday and you can visit our church and all of the things. And uh, so, they came to church with us and um, kind of the backstory to it was it was two churches that had merged. So the pastor of the original church was very elderly and was looking to um, kind of bring in someone to take over. And a pastor who had lived in Georgia had come up from Georgia and moved his entire congregation up. Most, I would say 90% of his congregation moved with him from Georgia. It was a fairly large church to come to this church, kind of integrate, and then this younger pastor from Georgia was supposed to take over. And I guess um, it was it was two very different dynamics merging. Um, the original church here in Tennessee had a very uh, Pentecostal leading, stoic, very um, legalistic uh, preacher. You know, women couldn't wear flip flops. We couldn't show our feet, skirts to the floor no jewelry, um, you know, of course, no cutting hair, all of the typical things in the message, but a little bit more overboard as far as the um, conservativeness went in the church. And then the church coming from Georgia was a little bit more on the opposite end of the um, conservativeness in the message, and they were a little bit more liberal. Um, so it was just, it, it was already not working quite well, I think, the, the merge of the two churches. And, um, and then the, past, the original pastor, the older gentleman, I think he realized that he was not quite ready for this and that it wasn't what he wanted anyway to come in and take over his church. 
So I don't remember too much about the service until the split started happening, but um, suddenly both pastors were on the pulpit and they were yelling over each other. It was kind of after the service, like when there was an the altar call, the that type of thing. So the preaching had already been done. And uh, they were suddenly both on the pulpit. Um, they were yelling over each other. And uh, I remember the younger pastor who was coming in to take over. I just remember him shouting the words, two heads is a monster, and there's a monster in this church. <laughs> wow. And um, I, I vividly remember those words. And um, he said, I want everybody to bow your heads right now and close your eyes. So of course, me being the little child that I am, I'm peeking and looking around, you know. And uh, he said, you know, whoever wants me to be pastor of this church, I want you to raise your hands. We're having a vote right now. So he like calls this vote while all this is going on. There's women crying and screaming and freaking out. And the pastor's wife is having a melt. The original pastor's wife is having a meltdown over in her spot to the left of me. And I don't remember if people were even voting. I can't remember if people raised their hands because chaos pretty much ensued after that. Everybody got up, started leaving. Um, us kids were kind of ushered outside by some adults because um, there was a lot going on in the sanctuary. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of arguing, um, a lot of shouting. And I remember the, the church had a big front porch and I was on the front porch with some of my friends and we were kind of like all huddled together and we were like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, the world is ending. <laughs> yeah, because you, you know, you've never seen adults act like this. You know, yeah. you just it was a whole new experience for us. And um, people started pouring out and I remember they were carrying the pastor, the original pastor lived right next to the church. And the, a couple of the deacons were carrying his wife to the house over there because she couldn't walk. She was crying so hard. She was, you know, completely breaking down and having a panic attack. And um, there, a big fist fight started out in the parking lot. I can't remember who it was. I remember who was breaking it up. I still know those gentlemen to this day. Um, but I, I can't remember who was actually fighting, but two of the brothers were just duking it out, throwing fists, <laughs> parking lot over <laughs> something i don't know what it was but so yeah and and it did it split wide open that was it the yeah. the original pastor stayed there at the church and um pretty much or you know i know all of the younger pastors congregational members left and they had church in various places until they finally established a, a building after a while so that was uh that was fun. That was a good one. <laughs> Until you have experienced a church where the leadership got into a knockout, drag out fight, you've not experienced the message. <clears throat> There's no, so many. That, that was, yeah. That was one for the books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there's so much there I'd like to talk about, but I, um, I, I'm one of these people that cry squirrel, and you mentioned the open toed shoes. This just fascinates me. I mean, to no end, it fascinates me because. Growing up, I I went to message churches from South Carolina to um, Arizona and everywhere in between, but there was a good part of my life where I would go to churches in Georgia in the summertime, and I would go to churches in Arizona during the rest of the time. And so I was going back and forth from the, you're not allowed to wear the open-toed shoes, to you are allowed to wear the open-toed shoes. And... I was too young really to care at that time. I, I, I just, I didn't even think it was nonsense in hindsight. I probably should have, but as I got older and got thinking about this, this is just so absurd to me as a, as a male and all males, you know, growing up, you go through this period where your hormones are raging and there are parts of a woman that become sexually attractive to a man but the feet just aren't one of them. <laughs> so tell us a little bit. <laughs> I feel stupid saying it, but tell us a little bit about the open-toed doctrine. How on earth did they spin that where that was even a thing? Because in the Bible, they wore sandals. <laughs> right. I I really don't understand. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, it was just... A doctrine I don't know where it comes from I think showing as little skin as possible is the idea um, I don't know like you said where you kind of you know when I think of people who are attracted <laughs> to feet I think of freaks so I'm not sure you know why the feet thing 
it was a big deal, but it was in that church. No flip top, flip flops, no open toed shoes, sandals, anything like that. Our feet had to be covered. Um, you know, it wasn't even at that particular church skirts, you know, below the knee were not even really a thing. You know, it had to be to your ankles, like very, very conservative at that particular church. And I was kind of in the same situation as you because there was another church in Tennessee the churches were about 30 minutes apart and at that particular time when the, that church split we were kind of bouncing back and forth between the two um i can thank my dad for that he had a lot of doctrinal um issues with pastors and as soon as he didn't agree and couldn't make the pastor see his way we would you know uproot and move so we were back and forth between two churches and the, the that other church that we were going to at that time was much more lax on the conservative so it was kind of like you know well when we go to church over here we gotta wear this and then when we go to church over here we can wear this so i i get that a little bit um we kind of had that going on too but yeah it was it was extreme over there i would say i mean not as not as extreme as some people have experienced in the cult in general but there was a lot of strange strange stuff going on over there that probably even more than I even remember. My mom could probably tell you a lot more about uh, the doctrines, especially that were, you know, going yeah. on. So it's, it was crazy. <clears throat> yeah. There, are, there are a lot of message believers who contact me and share some mail that is not quite friendly with me. <clears throat> and a common theme is we weren't like this. You're you're painting the message with this broad brush, and we weren't like this. But until you've been to several different message churches, and not even churches, because there's this home home church movement, right? You go, you play tapes in a garage or in your house or wherever, and there's all of these scattered, desperate, <coughs> different groups, right? And <clears throat> It's, it's almost to the detriment of the movement itself, because in a cult, you're taught a very black and white mentality. It's either right or it's wrong. There's no room for gray in a world that's filled with the gray, right? And add to this, this the psychology of different people, the backgrounds of different people. Like you said, one's Pentecostal and Stoic, one is not. Well, you have different men with different ideologies, and so as it grows and spreads, it can't be black or white, because if you are in this group and you're black as somebody else is gray or you're black <laughs> like the shoe thing, maybe somebody else is white. It, it's incompatible. And so for people like me that have went from church to church to church, what you end up with is you start feeling as though there is no truth in any of the churches. And where do you go? What do you do? Yes, I it, it it was very confusing for me. That's that's very true. And I I went to so many. I mean, we before my dad left, I think we moved. He left when I was fourteen. I think we moved sixteen or seventeen times before he even left um, <clears throat> all over the United States. So I've seen you know from one end to the other, extreme to not so extreme, you know, one foot in, one foot out type churches. Um, we had, so the, the preacher in California who had started his own garage church after that church had split up there, we ended up staying with them for quite a while. And he, um, him and my dad preached together and kind of formed, grew the church a little bit on their own. And then I don't know why they got some revelation that we needed to move to Texas. So we moved the whole church to Texas and um, they grew the church there for quite a while. I lived in Texas for a good little bit. We went to, on some mission trips down to Mexico. Um, and at that point when we did move to Texas, we were having church in our house. So, you know, sometimes we did play tapes for services. Um, and then it was always a bi always bilingual because that preacher from California was married to a Hispanic woman. And he spoke Spanish himself, so he they attracted, you know, the Hispanic crowd. Um, so the church was always bilingual, so services were always twice as long because he would preach in English and his wife or someone would translate into Spanish. And then as the church grew, it grew to be trilingual. A lot of French African people started coming, and so then it was three languages that we were you know, <laughs> listening to all sort of songs. So I literally have sat through two and a half hour sermons, most, you know, through that part of my childhood. It was just 
you know, it was normal. I didn't think yeah. anything of it. You know, at that age, you're just going with the flow, basically. You're not questioning things. But it, it does get very, now looking back, I wonder, why was I not confused? You know, because we would move here and we would change so many things to conform to that church. And then we would move to a different church and, you know, totally different thing of the way we dress, the way we act, you know, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. So looking back, you know, I should have been a lot more confused than I was. I guess that's part <laughs> of the brainwashing. Yeah. You know, that whole, the whole brainwashing thing to me still is surreal of how, how much you don't question and how much you don't think to right. ask a question or think something is off because you're just, you know, you're in that mentality of this is normal. This is my life. And when you're born into it like me and, and very involved in it, I was, you know, I was in 100%. I was, I read all the books. I listened to all the tapes. I fell asleep at night listening to Branham on the tapes. You know, I just, I took notes every service. I was, read the whole Bible all the way through. You know, I was just in it. Never, never occurred to me that anything was wrong. I just never. It was, it was really, um, amazing how much I was brainwashed coming out and looking back and realizing it's yeah, insane. Yeah, and you're newly out of this, so your perspective is going to be different than even my perspective because the way that the brainwashing, the mind control works, you don't even realize what is happening to you as it begins to unravel and as you begin to shift. So it's it's actually really fortunate that we're capturing this right now so that we can document what is it like going through that process? But before we do, I, <laughs> I went down another squ squirrel. I, I raised another squirrel <laughs> segment. You started talking <laughs> about the tape homes. We did this, right? <clears throat> I grew up in, in little small towns sometimes where there was no church. And so we had a tape home church, which is to the whole rest of the world who was never in this thing, they're like scratching their heads. What in the world are they talking about? <laughs> so I've waited yeah. to have somebody else who did this like me so that we can describe this thing and get it on record what this actually is and how weird this is. Because for the rest of the world, <laughs> this is this is complete nonsense. But <clears throat> I have been in I've been in places where they had a tape home church and we would dress up all decked out in our Sunday clothes, suit and tie, to go sit in somebody's living room in a corner. <laughs> what was it like for you in these tape home churches? Yeah, pretty much exactly that. Um, so we went back and forth between having it at our house and then having it at the other preacher, him and his wife's house. And it was exactly that. I remember that we would get up early, eat breakfast and, you know, get the house clean. And then we would get our dresses on. We would fix our hair everything just like we were going to walk out the door and go to church and then people would start showing up and we would just kind of set up some chairs around so everybody had a place to sit and my dad or the other preacher would get up and you know we would sing songs we always had a piano in our house um, my mom played piano and then i learned to play on and my sisters as well so somebody would play piano we would all sing songs just like a normal worship service and then press play <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as they say. Um, and yeah, listen to a tape. Sometimes they would preach. So it wasn't like a strictly only tape services, but we did listen to tapes quite a bit. And um, yeah, you listen to the tape and then sing songs again at the end. And then everybody fellowships and maybe eat something if, if we had cooked or whatever, and then everybody goes home. So it's, it's really strange. I can see where a lot of people from the outside looking in would think, what in the world is that? But it, it that's what it was. You know, you dress up just like you're going to church. <laughs> yeah, it's just so odd. I mean, to a normal Christian who goes to church on Sunday and they go because there's a desire to fellowship and there's a desire to plant a church community where the community can have outreach and help the community grow and influence the community in a positive way. This idea is just so foreign to them. To sit in seclusion in your home where you can't have any impact on the community whatsoever and press play on a tape from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, it reminds me, I don't know if you saw it, the show called WandaVision, where 
the uh, Marvel superhero is stuck in the, <laughs> I think it was the forties or fifties that she's stuck in and she's playing, she's watching the old black and white TV shows and it's this black and white world, but there's this recurring theme in fantasy and uh, especially in horror where somebody is stuck in the mindset of something in the past. And, um, for, for me, that's what it was like because we were literally listening to sermons talking about events that happened long before I was even born. And after you leave that and you experience a normal church where there are efforts to help the homeless people, for example, that's one of the big things in the church that my family attends now. And there's, there's all of this all of these motives to help the community grow and become better. And the church is a good place to do that. But yet we sat in seclusion. So <laughs> sorry for the rabbit trail, but I, I had to talk about that because that's something we have in common. Yes, definitely. I think you're right. Um, I also think the way I rationalized it once I came out was we are kind of subconsciously programmed to be isolated like that. Um, I think there's a big fear in a lot of the churches in the message that if you do explore or you do go to a denominational church or you do get too big, you know, uh, outreach and things like that were always kind of negatively looked on at most of the churches that I went to. It was, we're elite, you know, we have our own path. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to get more revelation. We're called to be the bride and, you know, we stick to ourselves kind of a thing. And that never really bothered me until toward the end when I started to wonder why, you know, why are we elite? Why aren't we helping people? Why aren't we doing more outreach? And of course I was not, I'll explain that in a minute, but I wasn't, you know, in the message, so to speak at that point, I had kind of went out into the world as they say. <laughs> uh, so, so I was seeing more of those denominations and we were visiting some churches and I was seeing the outreach and seeing the difference in, you know, the involvement in the community. And I really started to wonder at that point, why don't we do that in the message? Because we preach all day long, save those souls, you know, bring everyone to God, but the outreach isn't there. At least it wasn't at most of the churches that I went to for any amount of time. So, but yeah, I think they are. I think they're very much, even if the pastors don't realize it, I think that we are programmed in a way to be secluded and to, you know, things like those home churches that people have where they just, you know, get together in a really small group and listen to tapes. To them, that's kind of a ideal scenario where, you know, we don't, you know, we're small, we're, you know, we got our own thing going, we're not involved with the outside world. And I don't know, I think it's kind of a, a good thing in their eyes when in reality I look back and I'm like, that's so strange, you know, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's so odd. <clears throat> you know, I'm one of the few people who actually, I'm one of the few Christians who's actually read their Bible. I'm, I'm learning that this is a thing and I'm ap actually very shocked that in a world where <clears throat> people are going to churches and they profess Christianity, they don't even read the book that is like the thing that should be <laughs> the the thing that helps them know their religion. They don't read it. So I'm, I'm a little surprised, but <clears throat> take that to a message believer. I'm also one of the few that actually listened to the recordings and paid attention when I listened. There's a vast majority of people have no idea what are on these things. And <clears throat> I, what I did not have at the time that I was in this thing was the ability to critically think, analyze, and piece together the flow of this thing because it wasn't just one message. This is the most shocking thing to me of all. It wasn't one message. There were messages. There were different platforms and different stage personas that he would enter into. And... I didn't know this because I had not critically thought about the timeline and lined them up. But in the early years, as with any cult, it's always everybody's welcome. I don't care who you are. You can be Catholic. You can be Baptist. Come join us. We're all one people. And if one of the quotes that Branham used was, if, if they draw you out of your circle, I'm going to draw a bigger circle and draw you into it. We're all going to be one. And that's a good thing. Um, you know, he said some good things, and that is one of them. But like all destructive cults, as time went on, and he started introducing some very heretical, very 
evil things. Well, people started cutting him off, and then he says, okay, if you're not going to play with me, I'm just going to take my group of people away from you. I'm going to draw them out of your circles. And so you go to the latter years, and it's a isolationist religion. And people, unfortunately, are stuck in that isolationist mode because before he died, it became that, and then it became hyper-isolationist. And to the extent, I've actually sat in churches where they would talk about the people who were in the same city that were cannon fodder. And this term means basically these are the expendable troops that we know we're going to send them into the battlefield and they're just going to be blown to bits by cannons. And we don't care because it's going to strategically advance our troops. That's how they saw every other Christian in the city instead of coming together in a community, which is so wrong and so backwards. So... I'm also interested because you are one of the few people who left the message but didn't leave the message mentality and had to address that later. I was very surprised the first time I encountered a person like this. He had been away, gosh, I want to say it was like 20 years, and he'd been in different churches. Now he's a he's real big in the leadership and in the church that he's at now, but... He had almost lost religion altogether because he would try a church, and this stuff they had grilled into our heads was stuck in his head, and he didn't realize what it was doing to him psychologically. So I'd like to talk through that a bit. What was it like leaving the message but not leaving it from your head? Yeah, so that is very interesting, and I have not met very many people like myself who have gone through that. Um, So... Most of the people that I know who have left the message are, you know, they left. Like, they don't believe it anymore. They don't want to go to church. They, you know, they don't believe any of the doctrine. You know, they just quit cold turkey kind of a situation. Um, But for me, we left. um, It was shortly after we'd gotten married in 2014, so maybe 2015. Um, We got very, very hurt at the church we were going to. So we, my husband was from that church that came up from Georgia. He was part of that congregation. Um, And we reconnected years later, a long series of events. And we all, we ended up going to that younger pastor's church. He had now established a building here in Tennessee. And we started going there, my mom and my sisters and I. And um, that's where I met my husband. So we got married in that church. And um, that was a fiasco. the wedding (laughs) so many stories um but anyway that particular pastor has a habit of if you do something that is wrong he will call you out from the pulpit sometimes by name wow and that's just the way he operates in his church so um i guess my dress had been uh not as conservative as he would have liked which Looking back, I feel like it was a pretty conservative dress. My mom was very conservative. She would have never let me, you know, be in a wedding dress that was considered non-conservative. You know, we put panels in because it was a little low. We had sewed panels in the front and the back and added sleeves to it. They were cap sleeves, which that's a no-no with a lot of people in the message. (laughs) (laughs) Those cap sleeves still send you to hell. Um, So uh, he preached from the pulpit. It it was a series of things, you know, that he had been saying from the pulpit that were offensive to me and my husband. We already had one foot out anyway. We, you know, we were on the fence at that point. And then he directly attacked um, me about my wedding dress in a sermon one Sunday morning and made a huge deal out of the fact that nobody was allowed to get married anymore unless he approved their wedding dress. And he... um, after that sermon, he literally tacked a poster to the bulletin board in the church about this huge list of requirements for a wedding dress and that it has to be approved by the pastor and all these things, which everyone in the future can thank me for that. I was the cause. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that was it for me. I was like, okay, this is not this is not Christianity. I was mad. This is I was nuts. like, you know. Yeah, I was like, this is crazy. I'm not going to sit in church. And everybody in that church knows he's talking to me. He's looking right at me. He basically could have said my name at that point, you know, and and it wouldn't have made a difference. Everybody knew what he was talking about. So we left um, and we went sporadically um, here and there at that 
not long after that, my mom left that church and went back to a different church in Tennessee. And um, so his family was at the one, mine was at the other. So we kind of bounced around back and forth and, and would go a little bit. And that's when we kind of really had our, our um, a wild child time, I like to call it. <laughs> uh, we did all the things that we were never allowed to do. You know, we went drinking and did all the things that, you know, as a message kid, you just you don't, you know, you're not allowed to do so. Um, and then we calmed down after a while. And the whole time I, I never, I never had this thought, like the message is not the truth. I didn't like that. I was upset with that pastor and I didn't believe that he was preaching as he should. Um, but I didn't believe that like the message was false or anything like that. And I'll, I always thought in the back of my head, I'll go back. I'm going to do my thing for a while. I'm hurt. I'm angry. I'm having fun right now. I'll go back at some point. Um, and I continued with that mentality. That was when I was 22, 23. Um, and then I had my first child in 2018. And that's when I started to feel the urge. I had this like motherly, you know, I got to have my kid in church. I want my kid to know about God. I want my kid to know the, all the Jesus stories and all that kind of thing. So that's when I started feeling the urge for the first time that I need to get back in church for the sake of my kid. I didn't really want to go back, but I wanted my, my child in church, as crazy as that sounds. It was just really important to me that they have some kind of biblical foundation, I guess. My husband was not interested. He did not want to go back to church. Um, so I would take my son sporadically um, to my mom's church, not the one where I'd been ousted. Um, so I went, you know, here and there. And the whole time, of course, my mom has been very supportive of me. I have a great relationship with my mom, but she's always got that bug in my ear. You got to get back in church. You got to get back in church, you know. And so she was so excited when I started coming with my son. because She's like, oh, this is it. You know, this is what's going to push her back into the message. And I was kind of thinking the same thing, too. I was thinking this is my this is my, you know, road back in. This is my way to, to come back. But. I didn't realize how many questions I would have when I went back. It's like that time in the world kind of, I mean, we did visit some denominational churches and like I had talked about the outreach thing and the community thing. I saw a lot of that. And I, you know, going back to this message church, it's so isolated and so not involved in anything. And I started to think, you know, this doesn't feel right. Something's wrong. And, and then that led to different questions. And, I just started literally questioning everything and I was afraid to, I was so scared to, I didn't tell anybody. I never even said it out loud because <laughs> you don't question anything in the message, you know? So I didn't even tell my mom, like I was so, I was almost like, I felt like I was sinning because I was, yeah. you know, thinking these questions. Um, and then I had my daughter in 2022 and continued same thing kind of going back and forth and um i can't remember when it was exactly but it was sometime in the spring of 23 that um of oh, some friends of ours who were very close with my husband and him grew up together very close they were given the off the shelf podcast and um just left like immediately that was that was it and another young couple in the church as well were uh, had left at the same time so they shared that with John my husband and John started listening to this podcast and he was like babe you got to listen to this thing I'm like yeah yeah okay whatever and um so finally he sent it to me on I think it was on Spotify and I started listening to it and I didn't even make it through the first episode <laughs> I turned it off. I was like, Oh my God, this is blasphemy. Like I'm going to go to hell for even listening to these things. I was like, what is wrong with these people? Like William Branham's not a prophet. What are you even talking about? I couldn't even listen to it. I was scared to death, literally scared to death. My heart was racing. I turned it off and I left it alone for about a month. Um, but of course the questions that I had already developed were like raging now at this point because of the little bit that I did here on that podcast. So I picked it up in the summer of 23 again, and it was torture listening to the first few episodes, hearing some of the things that people were saying and hearing that 
you know, this man that I have followed my entire life and my entire life has been built around. And like, even though I wasn't living it for the past, however many years, uh, you know, eight years, nine years that I still believed it. You know, I always thought I'm going to come back. I would always tell mom, you know, I'll come back. I'll come back. I, I'm just, you know, I'm not ready or whatever. I never once questioned that it, he wasn't a, a true prophet, anything like that. So my world literally just flipped. I mean, I was physically sick listening to these episodes. I would drive down the road with the kids in the car because that's about the only time I could listen. And um, I would just cry. I was just, I couldn't even barely see to drive. Like I was just, even though I wasn't quote unquote living it word for word, I still never doubted it. And I still was just floored at the idea that my whole life has been a lie. I, I don't, maybe some people, my husband didn't struggle with it like that. Um, he heard the first false prophecy that they did in like the first episode. And he was like, I'm out. No, these false prophet, I'm done. <laughs> very simple for him, cut and dry. Um, but for me, no, you know, it was, it was hard. I listened to every single episode on that podcast and I wrote down, I have a notebook. My husband was like, what are you doing with that thing? Cause I carried it everywhere with me. I took it in the car every time I left. It was part of my grab the kids, grab the diaper bag, grab the notebook. And I would write down questions and I would write down things that I was hearing and, you know, was studying and researching and just, you know, basically losing my mind there for a little while over the whole thing. So it, it was, it was very hard because even though I did leave quote unquote physically, I never mentally left. I still believed it 100%. God sent a prophet. We're going in a rapture. That's the end of it. Like never doubted it. So it was uh, probably just as shocking as if I had been you know, living, quote unquote, living in the message and going to church regularly, it, it probably wouldn't have affected me much differently because in my mind, I was there. I was still a believer. <laughs> it is hard when you have invested your entire life into something and then it, there's this trust that's betrayed and you feel betrayed and internally you're like, no, this can't be. And so you have to, <laughs> you have to research this and then this other thing and this, well, this, if this can't be true, then this other thing can't be true. And this leads you on a rabbit trail of, I don't know how many hundred <laughs> different things that can't be true. Now I'll never forget. I sat down with my brother and I was just explaining one little thing and he's like, Oh, really? That was false? Well, I'm out. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, you know, the whole thing is just so shocking because everybody handles it differently. I think it depends on mentally where they are. And my brother had recently gone through some severely traumatic experiences. And in fact, that's his was so traumatic that it's part of my leaving. I went through the same trauma. And um, <clears throat> what he went through, I think, kind of shook him enough that he was able to break free. But mentally, there are some people that just can't. And so it, you know, it develops into this lifelong journey of research. And like, like I've done, I just, I can't stop. Mm -hmm. But then for other people, they are able to finally rest at peace. Okay, now I know that this was false. Now I know that I've been lied to. I can move on. So let's talk a little bit about the moving on part. How, you know, you're recently escaped. How is it going through that transition mentally? It's very hard still, I feel like. Um, I've gotten past the physically sick and crying while I listen to podcasts. I'm going through your podcast right now with uh, Charles. And uh, I don't cry anymore while I'm listening <laughs> to the podcast. So that's the <laughs> Um, but it has been hard. Um, we started going to a secular church. It's got a Baptist background. It's a very large, very large church here in Tennessee. And, um, I think it has helped. I want to be in church and my whole, my whole thing when I first started seeing this and first started coming out was I didn't know how to be a Christian without the message. I didn't know how to serve God without the message. Had no clue. I've always thought of myself as a relatively intelligent person, but coming out of this thing, I was like, I don't know how to do this without a message, without a prophet. And that's when I realized just how much my Christian journey was about a man and not God. 
you don't see that when you're in the message. You don't see how much it is about William Branham and, to, and not God until you get out. And I really struggled to find, I'm still struggling, honestly, to find my place in Christianity, I think. I like the church that we're going to. My husband loves it, which is mostly why I'm going. He's never really been interested in church before, and he loves this church. So, you know, that's where we are, and I, I do like it. But I think we talked a little bit before about the triggers that sometimes, you yes. know, come from in churches like that. Um I get triggered a lot, and my husband's like, what, what's that, what's the trigger, you know, <laughs> like, he's, he's out, he's done, you know, he doesn't understand my my mentality, but um, yeah, I, I get triggered a lot, I'll hear a song, you know, or they'll read a scripture, and it's, um, I don't know, it's hard to, I'm still trying to find my footing in a lot of ways on what do I believe now, what do I need to believe you know, Christianity, I, the way I always explain it to people is I think Christianity is a lot more simple than I was taught. You know, you believe God, you try to do the right thing, and, you know, that's pretty much it. And in the message, it's a whole list of things. You know, you're yeah. not going to make it to heaven unless you do this and you do that and you wear this and you don't watch that. And, you know, it's it's been hard for me. Sometimes it's hard for me to listen to the sermons at the church that we're at because I feel like they're so simple. And my husband's like, yeah, but that's how it's supposed to be. You know, you're supposed to be able to understand what you're hearing from the pulpit. And I'm like, well, that's valid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I was under a lot of very theological preachers. And sometimes I was just lost, you know, just yeah. taking notes because that's what I do. Don't really understand what's going on. So to hear a sermon about, you know, God died on the cross, he died for your sins, all you need to do is believe it and accept him, and you're saved. You know, to me, that's very, I describe it as simple, but I think it's very needed. I, I do think it's helping me heal. Um, it's just, I still struggle with a lot of fear. I still struggle with a lot of anxiety. I wouldn't say a lot. I would say that's diminished, but some anxiety about, you know, I'm not going to make it because my whole life I was taught that once you have something revealed to you, that's what you have to believe in order to make it to heaven. So God reveals what he reveals to Baptist people, and that's all they need to make it to heaven because they don't have the revelation that we have, but because you're in the message and you have the revelation of the seven seals and the fivefold ministry and this and that, you know, that's what you have to believe in order to go to heaven. That's how I was raised in most of the churches that I went to. So, you know, that fear was so real at first that I can't go to a different church. I can't go to a different denomination because I already have this revelation and I have to believe that or I'm going to hell. So there's a lot of fear that is, involved, I think, with leaving the message um, for most people. And it doesn't just go away overnight. You know, it's something that I'm still working through. Sometimes I still go down some rabbit holes and think, you know, I'm, I'm going to hell. I, you know, I, it's just, it's, it's hard to explain, but you're, I was so indoctrinated with that. This is it. You know, once you're in the message, that's your only way to make it to heaven. If you leave, you can't just go be a Baptist. You can't go be a Pentecostal. You know, you're not going to make it. So that's been mentally challenging for me. Yeah, it's kind of funny because one of the sermons was God and simplicity. And then he <laughs> proceeded to make it so complicated that not a single minister in the entire movement can explain it. And if you get two of them in a room, neither one of them are going to agree on, on what was the simplicity thing that we had. And okay. I think I mentioned this recently, but I took one of these little, you know, how to be a Christian courses at the, it was a, I think it was a Baptist church we went to afterwards. And they gave me this little tiny book of what is the gospel. And I was like, there's no way you can fit it in this little tiny book, man. It's got to be at least <laughs> this thick to explain what is the gospel. Because that's right. what we were taught, right? And that God is in his simplicity is this big, thick book, twice as big as the Bible. And, you know, yet here's the gospel. Believe in Jesus and be saved. <laughs> it's right. just so backwards. So, well, yes. if you could look, turn back time and you could tell yourself something to encourage yourself on what life would be like later and 
how life would change after you left, what would you tell your former self? I would tell my former self to be more aware, to ask more questions, and to look at things from an outside perspective, not get so lost in where you are. Um, I struggled with a lot of that just with everything in life. It took me a long time to learn how to step back and really examine a situation. A long time, like I'm talking just the last few years, couple years maybe. Um, and I don't know, I would tell myself to not not go so all in, I guess, with something until you're sure, because I tend to do that. I get excited about something or I believe in something and I go all in and I end up getting hurt, which, you know, for a lot of us in the message, that we're in the message, I guess you can't really blame yourself for it when you're born into it because it's all you know. But I really was all in, you know, I just, I never questioned anything. I never, even with all the things going around me, there were so many things that happened along my journey in the message that looking back, I'm like, was that not a huge freaking red flag, yeah. you know, waving <laughs> in the wind? You just, I guess that's part of the brainwashing. Um, you don't see it until you're out. There's so many things you don't see till you're on the outside. So I wish I had been a lot more conscious about what was going on around me. I don't know how much it would have really saved me from struggling on this journey out because I was born into it. But um, yeah, it would have been interesting to see what my life would have been like had I grown up a little differently. You know, it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's been, it's been wild. I think that's good advice. Even if you weren't in something like this, you should always critically think about what it is you're doing, what it is you're in, and things change. People change. You know, you may have a, you may be in a church where there's a really good minister who's preaching the good gospel, and then suddenly he has some sort of a mental health issue that twists it into something else, and he becomes a guy that you need to critically think about. You just don't know. Uh, fortunately, many of the churches that we've experienced post-message, they have a set of checks and balances where it's very difficult for this kind of thing to even happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, if one guy starts to go off the rails, well, the other guys are going to either reel him in or replace him with somebody who's not off the rails, which is another problem for <laughs> that we could describe in this thing for another day. But <clears throat> anyway, I'm very glad that you came on and did this. I think... Um, and a lot of people are going to be encouraged to see somebody who has successfully made it on the other side. And I just want to say that yours was doubly difficult because I know I've worked with the people who have left the message physically, but not mentally. And the physical part is easy. You just walk out the door, but the mental part going through that is very, very difficult especially if you've been away and it's been stuck in your head for so long. It means that the indoctrination was still in your head for all that time. And so my encouragement to you is that it will get better even where you think you are now. Ten years from now, <laughs> you'll look back and think, wow, I was still mentally in this thing, even though I'd left and I thought I was no longer mentally in this thing. <laughs> yes. I know that I, I still am struggling with a lot, you know, there's a lot that I'm still processing. I'm still, I'm deep diving into the history of William Branham. I can't help it. I can't stop myself. I want to know every detail about this man. And that's just, you know, that's how I am when I learn something new, I got to know it all, especially with something like this, where it has been my whole life. I had this whole idea of who that he was and that was so wrong, you know, so it's going, I know it's going to continue to be a journey. Um, I also know that I've made it through a lot more than most people have in my life and that I can do it. Um, things also, you know, that I look back on and wonder why I didn't quite, you know, I had a lot of things happen to me that most people would really start to question. And I just didn't, you know, my whole situation with my dad leaving, and, you know, starting over, bringing a woman back from Russia to marry and starting a whole nother family and just kind of dropping us in the dust. A man who'd been a preacher, had been married for 20 years and, you know, 
other men in the message who became father figures to me um, who had an affair. One of them was a preacher in the church, had an affair and totally left the message over it. And I've seen a lot in my life that I should have said, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah. not normal. Yeah, you know, this is not what the message says we're supposed to be, you know? Yeah. But I just, you know, I ignored it all. I guess it was part of the brainwashing. So it's, it's a lot coming out and looking back. I'm still looking back and remembering things or, you know, trying to be sneaky and ask my mom because she has no idea and, you know, bring up some memories and try to get information out of her. And I look back and I'm like, Oh my God, how did yeah. I not see it? You know? <laughs> so I know my eyes have been significantly opened and they're still being opened. You know, every day I think of something new where I'm like, Oh my God, I remember such yeah. and such happened. What in the world? So it's a journey. It is. And I think that's just it. You know, every single group of people, I don't care what church it is, whatever group it is, people have people problems. And you're going to find people problems. You're going to go to your new church, you're going to find people who have people problems. But we were told in this cult that we were the elite group and we were maintained by God. And, you know, we, we were above all of the rest. And in the end, you're left thinking, well, how how is it better <laughs> it's it's right. the same people have people problems um last question i'll ask you of all of the different things that you found shocking about william branham what is the thing that you found so far that has been the most shocking oh okay so that's probably going to be uh, a close tie between the fact that his mentor was second in command of the Ku Klux Klan, that Roy Davis was the man that kind of really brought him in and got him started in all of this. And that he was such a different, the idea, it's hard to explain. I'm trying to think of how to put it into words. So he comes across, you know, you read his life story and he comes across as this poor, humble, um, trying to serve God, you know, giving up everything for God person. And he had all this tragedy in his life. He was super sick, you know, he had all those stomach issues and his eyes, you know, he had these big thick glasses. You just every little detail about him was brings, you know, it makes you feel sympathetic toward him when you read his life story books. And then to see some of the stuff that he was involved in some of these conventions that he was involved in where there were stage acts going on and that he was with this whole Ku Klux Klan and some of the things he said about them, you know, that he'll love them forever because they paid his medical bills. And he's such a different person than what I was told my whole life. Just him as a person, not even what he preached, just him as a person. That was shocking to me that his background and where he came from, who really introduced him into re this religion and the start of the whole message. And the fact that I don't know if those life story books were doctored, uh, you know, things were changed, stories were changed, but the fact that he was just absolutely a completely different person than I was told about him and read about him. That's what was so hard for me. It wasn't like, you know, he was just a little bit different or, you know, well, this was a little off. No, the whole thing was grossly off, like beyond. That's, that's what has been the most shocking for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was for me too. If it was one little thing that was a lie, you're like, okay, well, you know, he lied. So what? But when it's all right. a lie, you're like, for me, I was just, I was overwhelmed. And that's part of yes. what drove me to continue researching because no, it can't all be false. There's got to be, I, I actually <laughs> went down my research because I was trying to find something that was true. <laughs> and the further and further I went, I'm like, no, man, not this too, not this too. And the further you go, you're like, in the end, you just step back and you think, okay, this whole thing, it was a scheme. And there were a bunch of men involved. And Maybe that's not so problematic, but what types of men were behind this scheme? And that's for me. Uh, at that point, I could not, you know, I couldn't go with this anymore. This was this was wrong. <laughs> there were some very bad people involved. So yeah, it, I, that's that's the same for me. I was just I was floored by the fact that 
this was not, you know, it was more of a business in some yeah. ways than anything else. And that was very hard for me to accept. You know, I was always told that it was this huge lifelong, you know, thing of scraping up enough money to go preach abroad and bring souls to Christ in foreign lands and, you know, having these big tent meetings because they couldn't afford buildings and, you know, scraping by his entire life and then you see the reality of it you know that no they had money they had to have money to do these things he wasn't this poor you know physically sick had all this tragedy in his life you know backwoods preacher that was not who william branham was and i just had no idea it absolutely took my feet out from under me and i'm still struggling to get back up in some ways because it's just it was all such a lie that's that's been the hardest thing for me to process and to believe and that you know i don't blame my parents for raising me in the message but it's very hard to not be like how did you not ask you know how do you not look something up because it's not hard to find once you know I, looking back now i'm like it's all right there you know you guys have found it you have found so much and I'm like, you know, I guess, well, we're just programmed. You don't question, you don't ask. Yeah. So that's where it comes from. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you did get out and I'm glad that you're on a journey to healing. I know it takes time and it takes a lot of work. I think that's the one pe thing that people miss is once you leave, you it's not just simply walking away. You're not you're not walking yeah. away and then it's done. You're walking away and now you have to heal and that is a process that takes a lot of work. And thankfully, yes. I can look at you and I can already see that you're already being successful in this and the, the way that your facial expressions light up when you talk about your new life. So very glad that you did escape. Yes, me too. I'm thankful. I'm, I'm still very, um, I'm in a, a bit of a limbo situation with it because my family doesn't know. My mom and my sister, I'm still very close to and they are still die hard in the message. So it's, um, and my husband's parents, they, his dad knows that he does not believe in William Brandom anymore, but that's kind of, you know, the end of it. So we really haven't had that conversation with them. So I'm a little stressed about, that's the next hill I have to climb, I guess, is trying to find the balance between telling my family and maintaining the good relationships that we have, which I'm not really that worried about, but it's still a little apprehensive nonetheless. Um, but yeah, it's been a little tricky to hide it. And the more I hear, you know, my mom all the time, oh, William Branham said such and such. And every, it's, I feel like each time I hear it, I'm a little bit more like, Ugh, you know, <laughs> just it's getting a little hard to listen to. I'm, I'm getting a little bit more angry at the whole situation, the more I uncover. And uh, yeah, that eventually I've got to, I got to put a stop to the brand talk or I'm going to say something that is yeah. going to ruin it. You know, my advice so. to you is have that conversation soon, but have it once you're past the anger stage, because it should be done as peacefully as possible. Your mother can't yeah. help it that she, she was duped in the same way that we were duped. You know, your family right. can't help it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if approached properly, maybe they can wake up too. And then one big happy family escapes, right? <laughs> yeah. My, so. my husband keeps telling me, you need to invite your mom and your sister to church. We need to get them to come to church. I'm like, babe, babe, like you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> my mom is die hard, you know, just like I was never questioned, nothing, all of it. So you know, I don't know how that's going to go, but I do know that my mom is a very level headed person. Thank goodness. And, you know, she will have a relationship with me no matter what I choose to do. You know, going out into the world proved that she didn't, you know, we never lost our relationship over the fact that I wasn't going to church anymore. So it's just, this is a little bit, harder i think for a parent you know when you're in it and you're convinced that it's the only way to heaven and your child is telling you no it's not you know that's that's gonna hurt any parent so yeah i need some wisdom on uh, going through that <laughs> but uh i know i you know eventually we'll get there so 
We're just taking it one step at a time. That's all you can do at this point. Well, that's the best way to do it. And you've got a great support group of people behind you. So if you have questions, you know, you can contact us through the, through the website or through the support groups. And we're always glad to help. If you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the Healing Revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. 